Hello and welcome to MATLAB's Best Model. Um, today we're talking about machine learning models. Uh, I'm your host, Elsie Eigerman, and I'm joined by Heather Gore. Heather, why don't you introduce yourself to the audience? Thank you, Elsie. Yes, I'm Heather. I am uh, here to uh, weigh in on some of the models. I have a lot of modeling experience, um, machine learning, clearly. Uh, so a lot of my PhD was in, although it was in physics, I did machine learning for that. So. I'm really, really pumped to be here today for our best model competition, where we're going to have all the models compete against one another to uh, see who comes out on top or as the best. Right? Yes. Also, um, we should do a little bit of a disclaimer. Uh, th thanks to the National Weather Service, we do have some tornado warnings and like all of the severe things uh, weather wise. Uh, I almost changed it to the weather data just so we would know what's up, but um, just in case we cut out in the middle or somebody vanishes or the whole entire stream cuts out, if our um, IT folks have a power outage, just a uh, fair warning could get interesting. Yeah. And also, you might have heard some thunder. Uh, so anyway, it's pretty fun and exciting. I absolutely love it. All right, are we ready to do this? Yeah, let's get started. Awesome. So, um, just a quick idea of what we're doing here, you know, this best model series, you know, although we're having fun with uh, the title and stuff, you know, we're really just going through a series of, you know, um, understanding what these AI, like machine learning, deep learning models, you know, what they're all about, giving you a little bit of a sense of um, the mathematics and sort of the reasoning behind some of the models. Of course, in MATLAB, we make it really easy to experiment and try them, but hopefully this will give you a sense of what which ones to watch out for based on certain data. Um, and then, you know, we'll have our second series. This is our first in the series. So uh, you're getting the debut of our best model competition. Uh, and we will be following up in a couple of weeks with our deep learning one. So hopefully, uh, you have, if you have questions around a lot of the neural networks and things that we'll be talking about, we'll be covering that uh, in a couple of weeks. Go. All right. So um, we've got a couple of challenges, or, you know, just sort of thinking through, you know, I don't know, I guess making it more interesting. Um, but, you know, mostly we want to look at regression, classification and regression. Um, these have two different apps in MATLAB. So we're also, I put, uh, you know, screenshots here just to remind us to talk about that. We're going to be using the apps so that all of the models look absolutely beautiful and the best lighting in the best way possible. Um, but it's also just really easy to compare and, you know, kind of get get things going really quickly. Um, but so classification, we're going to be, um, you know, identifying or predicting a label or, you know, something in our case, I'll talk more about this in a sec, but, you know, we're predicting activities like are we sitting, standing, dancing? Um, we'll find out. And then regression is more of our typical like y equals mx plus b. Maybe I should have started with that one. Everybody knows about that. <laughs> um, but it also, you know, a lot of the models kind of overlap. So that'll be really good because we can uh, show that. And regression is more typical to, you know, you're um, predicting something numeric. So we want to see, uh, you know, um, a, a numeric value in the end, not a label. So that's that's something that is really common, of course, with, you know, predicting. Well, so the, the, the main difference is just numeric versus categorical. Pretty much, yeah. And so we'll see a couple of algorithms that are design specific, but a lot of them are going to overlap. So, so we're going to um, really overload the well, <laughs> some of the different an overloaded term, I suppose. Um, but we're going to spend a lot of time on the classification part, going through all the algorithms, and then we'll just kind of show you know the ones that don't overlap much in the regression part. So yeah, you you hit it right on the head. At least at this point, we're going to just mostly talk about the. Uh, final result and the differences in how we assess them because of course we have judges um not necessarily us but judges being uh accuracy you know the typical kind of training or uh, testing criteria that we use in machine learning and deep learning where you know for classification it's just sort of how many are right you know that that's pretty straightforward you know how many are classified properly um and then of course the speed you know that may or may not matter to you of course that's why I have a little star here, like a couple of these things, you know, we're going to use our own criteria. Well, also just the apps criteria, right? But, you know, interpretability is 
up to interpretation <laughs> um, or up to, um, you know, that kind of thing. So we'll talk a lot about that, but we're um, going to separate that a little bit. Um, and then even overall quality can kind of, you know, it depends on what is most important to you. Maybe it's super important to have a fast model or it's super important to have an accurate one. Um, so anyway, we'll talk about that a lot more as we go along. And Elsie is going to be keeping me on track, <laughs> hopefully um, keeping uh, questions coming. So feel free to put all of your questions in the chat. Uh, again, this is live. We'll, we'll take a couple of pauses here and there to, well, for me to like breathe and drink more coffee. It's half decaf, decaf it's fine. Um, <laughs> but, you know, put your questions in the chat if you have them specific or not specific necessarily to the algorithms. All right. Who are we ready for this? So, who do we have competing today? So we've got a pretty good list, I think. Um, these are really the most popular ones. Also, conveniently, they're in the app, but that's also why they're in the app because they're very popular for various reasons. So these are the ones we're going to focus on, and I tried to use this little indication of kind of the ones that overlap a lot. Um, so hopefully that. as we go along, but there's a lot of good contenders here. Let's just put it that way. Now, Heather, I have to ask, do you have a favorite of the, the, the models we have? We have a... I have a couple actually. So I'm gonna say, I love myself a tree. I love, tree, the, I trees, love the, ensembles, the, the ensembles of forests, um, largely because of the puns, um, but also because of the versatility of their uh, ability to train on a lot of data. So they don't really make a lot of assumptions. It's just like, what do you got? Oh, let me figure it out. Um, and then ensembles just do that to scale. So that's pretty cool. Also, we're probably going to talk more about neural networks. That's a pretty big one. It's going to be huge in the next uh, show, September 2nd. Um, but we're going to kind of tease that a little bit. And also, it's pretty old. I mean, it, this is just a lot of linear algebra behind the scenes. You know, every, all these models look so beautiful and so complex and so interesting. But, you know, at the end of the day, it's just a pile of linear algebra, um, which is why we're going to be using MATLAB and these apps to really compare them pretty easily. And, you know, we'll, again, answer some questions, you know, we'll have any kind of mathematical questions you've been having as you're going along. Uh, feel free. All right. Are we ready for this? Let's, Let's do it. Start. So we're going to break it out to our two challenges, like the uh, classification and regression challenges. We're going to have two different data sets. They're going to be from the documentation, just so we're completely fair, so that anybody that wants to follow along and try it, they know we're not trying to, you know, bias anything. Um, but so we wanted to talk, especially, uh, you know, when we talk next time about deep learning, it's, it can be a little bit different here. But when we when it comes to the data, you kind of just want it in a spreadsheet, sort of like this, you know, where um, or something that you're familiar with, where you have like, uh, you know, a row is an observation or like a measurement in you know science or whatever, and then your variables, these are the predictors that you're going to be you know use using as your you know variables. One thing we'll, we don't really touch on too much in the examples that we'll show, but it's important for your models um, is whether you can have categorical predictors. So, you know, in this example, it's just, you know, having the location as categorical. We'll see later that we have, um, you know, vehicle data where, you know, the miles per gallon or like the horsepower, those kinds of things might be categorical. So some models just don't work like that. So we'll talk about that a little bit. Um, and then your response or like the thing that you're predicting, you know, that's, that's basically, you know, for both classification and regression, that's the terminology at least. And um, this is, you know, Largely for classification, this is going to be categorical where it's repeated. You know, you have a couple of different labels. Um, and then for regression, that's numeric, like we talked about. And one interesting thing we won't get into too much here, but, you know, oftentimes you want to, you oftentimes want to figure out how to deal with the time. Um, not just how much time you have to do all of this stuff, uh, but, you know, if you have time in your data set, you know, how do you manage that in machine learning problems. Largely, you want to separate it out. You know, they're um, not necessarily the like, uh, you know, forecasting kind of models like Arima, Garch, whatever, I won't bury you in lingo. <laughs> um, but, you know, there are some that are very good for taking those um, series, 
series kinds of calculations. Um, but a lot of times you want to just separate it out. You know, maybe the month is the only thing that's important here, or you can just, you know, use a time of year or something like that. But anyways, all just sort of things to think about uh, to kind of set the stage for what we're going to do. So everybody's on the same stage for the runway, I guess. All Before right. Get started. I was I was wondering um, if it isn't too much of a trouble. We're getting some questions about where they can find this data set. Absolutely. Um, is there is there any chance you give us a rundown of, of of where this data can be found? Absolutely. So perfect timing because uh, we're going to talk about that right now. So okay, we're going to use great. signal data um, because it's really really common for you know a lot of MATLAB users to have um, sensors or you know kind of signals. Uh, as opposed to just sort of a spreadsheet of um, you know, financial data. Well, that also happens a lot, a lot of times, but it's very interesting. So uh, we're not going to completely follow this example 100%. Uh, Oops. Uh, but let me go back in here. So it is fit C auto and fit R auto. So um, we're going to use the data set. These are just built into MATLAB. This one is in the statistics toolbox, but we're going to be following, you know, these examples and one of them, oh wait, here we go. This one uses the human activity data. So um, mostly I'll be using the apps. So, you know, we can, we'll share a bunch of examples, um, you know, in the chat or you can just find them very easily by selecting examples in the doc. Um, but we'll largely follow the fit C auto and fit R auto. Um, the examples there. Where was that link? Here we go. So that's where uh, the data will come from. In this case, it's actually already kind of prepared for machine learning. Like we talked about the expectations where, you know, each row has that label, right? So whenever it comes to sensor data, you know, you have like tons of sensor and with <laughs> tons of data, sorry. Uh, and with this example, this is from, um, you're trying to predict, you know, what you're doing. So let's say I had my cell phone in my pocket, as if uh, I had pockets ever, but, um, you know, that would help indicate whether I was sitting, standing, dancing in my chair even. Uh, and taking all the sensor data, you know, you, you don't necessarily, for machine learning, want to do one data point at a time. You want to represent it. So that's why this is pretty interesting because it also, you know, depending on what your application is, you can find other examples where it takes that, you know, raw sensor data and helps um, figure out how to process that. So you're not just, you know, putting piles and piles of data in it. All right. All right. So, how are we feeling about these? <laughs> oh, <laughs> I have pretty strong feelings about all of this stuff. Let me actually stop this thing from running. And uh, okay, I'm gonna start this. So the, I'm using the classification learner. I just, I wanted to get these started because I'm using the activity data set is actually a pretty realistic um, size of data. You know, so that's, I think that's really important and whenever we're trying to make decisions about the models, we want it to be realistic. You know, we're not using the IRIS data set the wonderful, it you know, most people, many people using MATLAB have this kind of data, so we wanted to work on that. Um, also, just kind of FYI, I mean, uh, I have four cores on this uh, machine in a GPU. Not to brag, uh, but <laughs> um, so it's training in parallel, so you can see it kind of running four at a time. But so you know, these are the models that we're gonna we're just gonna kind of go down the list and talk about them as we go. Just a quick little hint though, you know, if you're not satisfied with my explanation, you can mouse over and see, you know, kind of a preview of what's going on. So uh, again, that's kind of why we wanted to do this was to give you a good idea of what kinds of models to use, which ones might be more interesting or easier to interpret, things like that, um, and, you know, might be best for your application. And of course, which are the most beautiful. Um, <laughs> so, we're going to start out with some pretty basic ones, I think, um, but it really helps because it'll help uh, tell some stories later. So uh, our KNN, um, also these are the easiest to explain, so it's good to start out with. Um, and again, maybe the most important thing in your application is the ability to explain what just happened. You know, so it's it's worthwhile to kind of go through these. Now, 
I'm kind of leaning towards nearest neighbor on this one. Um, I'll tell you why. Because, uh, so with signal data, you know, you have lots of noise, you know, you may not necessarily have a good uh, distribution of data or sort of that, you know, proper statistical, um, I don't know, assumptions. So, you know, nearest neighbor just sort of plots it all in n dimensions. This is two for illustration. And then um, it'll just say, hey, you want one neighbor? I'll just take the closest one. And that's the class. Uh, you want four? I'll give the average. So um, that can be nice because the only sort of magic or art in that algorithm is the distance measurement. So that can be easy to explain, but also can take a while. And then naive Bayes is more like, uh, it, it makes a lot of assumptions. It's naive, I guess. Uh, and, you know, it'll fit the uh, distributions. It'll fit a normal distribution along the way. So it, it makes that assumption uh, first, like before it even does anything. So uh, oftentimes if you don't have data like that, even the app will just tell you, it'll just, you know, say failed and it'll give you an indication that, you know, a normal distribution couldn't be fit for that one. So that's kind of why I'm kind of feeling the uh, nearest neighbor. Um, even though probabilities are excellent, uh, let's see what happens. <laughs> um, these were from yesterday, so we'll go back and make sure. Ooh, interesting. So our naive Bayes, that was 95%. I'm putting up the confusion matrix. So that, uh, also real quick, we're uh, finding the accuracy just from you know, basically the number of correct uh, percentages. So uh, that's pretty straightforward. I think it's a good way to start things. And then the confusion matrix is a great way to see, uh, you know, if maybe they all have the same percentage, but some of them might be, you know, here were, uh, you know, a lot of the dancing and running are misclassified. That makes sense, I guess, <laughs> um, similar kind of movements. Uh, so, you know, we might want to look at a model that has a better spread as opposed to the accuracy. So we'll, we'll kind of take all that stuff into account. Also notice <laughs> this kernel naive B is, is still running because uh, that one takes a while. Why don't you start running that one? So um, I guess right before we started, so it's been a couple, it's been almost 20 minutes now. Um, and that is one of the few that are still running. KNN also can be a while. So th those can take some time. Um, I also should mention that the difference between the, uh, you know, why did this one <laughs> take hardly any time and this one was taking forever? Um, a kernel is doing a lot more, I don't know, calculations around the data point. So it, it does a little bit of smoothing in some cases and windowing. And so those can take a while, but those can also be much more accurate depending on the data, especially if you have like seasonal kinds of data, it'll really capture some of that more so than the others. Um, but that's why you'll, you'll see uh, with others that we'll talk about if they have a kernel option, a lot of times that's going to take longer and oftentimes, depending on your data, that can be more accurate. So uh, I guess in this case, our medium KNN. So another thing about the app, you know, especially with nearest neighbor, there are, you know, you can have, like we talked about one or four or however many, uh, and then you can also change the distance measure. So it's doing sort of the most common ones here. Um, so yeah, I think those are some pretty good ones to start with. Uh, I think, you know, again, both of them are pretty easy to sort of understand on the output, you know, why did it come to that decision? But definitely uh, the model training speeds are very different. So the uh, naive base is taking, uh, or the nearest neighbor is taking a lot longer than the naive base because it's looking at every data point, like not just, you know, calculating the uh, distribution. So anyway, that's our first matchup. So uh, anyway, KNN seems to be coming out on top so far. <laughs> um, we'll do another. Well, so I'll pause after the next one to see if we have any questions, um, but it kind of leads right into the next one because we are talking about sort of like making mathematical assumptions versus just taking the data kind of as is, you know, um, and maybe I'm discriminating a bit, but I feel like the tree is going to do better on this one. 
All right. So I'll explain why. So the um, discriminant analysis is similar to our naive Bayes. It's kind of um, assuming a distribution already. And it takes the mean and covariance um, for each of the different classes. So then it takes that information and draws a boundary uh, line, basically. And so there's a couple of different options for that. There's, you know, quadratic, cubic, you know, those kinds of things. We'll also see this for others, um, where it's just basically how do you want to draw that line? You know, do you want it to be a straight line? Linear, obviously, is easiest to interpret. Uh, well, a tree is basically just binary decisions. And so a lot of times, you know, a lot. this is very, you know, fundamental to computer science, even just the notion of a, you know, KD tree. But uh, so they're really versatile and they'll work on a lot of data. It's not really making any assumptions. Uh, and then you can adjust. I, I think it's really fun because you can prune it and do tree things uh, to make it, you know, try to be more sensitive to the noise. Let's check it out. Uh, Close. It really is, actually. I was really surprised because a lot of times I don't trust uh, discriminate like sometimes a lot of times for me it'll fail because I have categorical predictors yeah um but you know this looks pretty good even uh better than the naive bees and then with our trees you know we at first you know these are like the fastest to train too so you'll see those uh come up first but uh if you notice the fine tree does the best out of all of them but that's because it has the most branches capture all that stuff which might be noise so um you know looking at the medium tree really similar just a little bit different spread so you know again something you might find interesting or not but yeah real close one i was kind of surprised with that one yeah it's it's, it's quite noticeable that uh, both of those models seem to have worse performances with predicting sitting than either of the the, the two first models we looked at and that is interesting so um i should also point out you know we're we're really talking about kind of the most you know fundamental things we're not really talking about adjusting things but let's say that sitting you know classifying sitting versus uh standing or even running and dancing we really really want to know the difference we can actually apply a, a cost to that like say we'll penalize it stronger than the other ones we really need to identify sitting so we'll just make sure that one you know if it is wrong it costs some more and so that'll be taken into account along the way in the model that was a good point. Uh, it is, yeah, again, maybe some of these are more important than others. You really want to take that into consideration whenever you're judging. So I like this matchup next because it's really similar to the last one. So uh, like I think of the last one as like the simplified single version of these ones. So our SVM is really similar to discriminant in the way that it um, draws kind of a boundary, right? And um, we have a lot of different options we'll talk through about how to draw that boundary. And then the bag trees are basically, well, we we'll talk a little bit more about different ensembles, but it's basically instead of trusting that one tree, maybe we want a whole forest of trees. Uh, so again, I love those puns. So that wins points in my book, but uh, it's also really helpful again, because the data assumptions, you know, are, you know, so solid. And then um, you know, you can take sort of a majority vote. So it's not just dependent on that one tree. So you, honestly, you almost always want to do an ensemble. But if you want to really back out and you want to um, understand it, the single tree has um, a documentation of every decision that it made. So that can be really helpful if you have to convince lawyers or something. Um, so anyway, uh, just kind of a visualization of this. The SVM does... Um, like I said, similar kinds of calculations. You have a lot of options, but it only takes uh, kind of the closest ones to the plane. So there's a lot of optimization that happens, um, which also can be adjusted. Um, but that is also why it's kind of, uh, it's nice because it's not fitting so much noise perhaps, and it's a little faster than it would be if it was taking all of those points into account. <sighs> okay. <laughs> oh, my tree, I should have had that pop up right away. All right, so also here we have very, very similar results. Let's double check because I took these screenshots yesterday. So our SVM, again, you notice all of the options here. Um, you have you know, many options for how that uh, boundary is uh, decided. And then you even have more if you want to adjust you know, different things. 
looks awesome. Uh, and then our ensembles are here at the bottom. Uh, here we go, bag tree. Really looks pretty similar. So <clears throat> I guess I also should mention since we, there's a boosted tree and a bag tree. Um, bag is bootstrap aggregation. So if that, that's sort of the notion of just taking a whole bunch of trees and like taking the um, majority vote. Um, that's the kind of the sense of that. And then um, boosted, there's a bunch of different algorithms for that. You can see them in the doc and all the math that goes along with it. But I'll just see that boosted are really usually good for um, whenever you have really imbalanced data. So let's say weather, you know, you have a lot of days where you don't have crazy storms and tornado warnings and also a live stream. Um, but so, you know, you, those will do really well for that kind of data where it's really kind of anomalous. All right, before we move on, we should stop and pause for questions. Yes, we're getting a, 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 a question of, is it possible to use GPU, GPU to train? Um, currently, I use TensorFlow with GPU to train networks. Awesome, great question. We'll, we'll probably talk a lot more about that in the next, um, the next uh, live stream whenever we talk about deep learning. Um, but right here, I, I technically am not using my GPU. I don't think I'm using um, all four cores, um, but most algorithms will have an option where it has like use parallel, use GPU, um, multi GPU. So it's very, very easy. You really don't have to set anything up on you know the back end to take advantage of the resources that you have. Pretty easy. Uh, so yeah, definitely check the documentation just for the um, you know details. And then it's easy to monitor also if you wanna check it out. I have, well, I call it my heater right below my um, foot here on my Linux machine. I have a couple of GPUs that I'm um, always testing out and very, very straightforward to do that in MATLAB. Also, I should point out, since it's about TensorFlow, um, the third part of this likely uh, will be calling TensorFlow, PyTorch, you know, calling um, models or networks that were trained elsewhere and either updating, visualize, or just predicting those in MATLAB. So it's very easy. You can just import TensorFlow. It's really straightforward if you want to explore different ways to do that too. Good one. Specifically, we're getting some questions about uh, what is a good amount of RAM for this? Um, someone's asking if 16 gigabytes of RAM um, is a must to run these basic models smoothly. That's a good question. Yeah, it a lot of times, yeah, really is dependent on your hardware. Um, I'm fortunate to work at MathWorks, thank you, and uh, work on deep learning stuff. So I, you know, get the laptop with the GPU and the multiple cores. Um, but I will say that, uh, you know, we, I, I've, I also have many other really awful computers and I do these things on those too. So um, the one thing that might be helpful for these, uh, you. You might run out of RAM. I mean, you'll get a warning right away if it thinks you will. Uh, or if <laughs> MATLAB, I yeah, I was thinking of Membi. That's um, LC's personification of the memory. Anyway, so if uh, MATLAB thinks that you're going to run out of memory, eventually you'll get a warning and then you'll get an error. Uh, but one way to mitigate that easily, if you don't have um, options, is to uh, do like a subset of the data at first. So I uh, brought this in from, you know, the doc example, uh, but, you know, I, I actually used only 60% of the data in the uh, training so that, you know, it's not going to take too long. Um, it's not going to take too much memory. Also, some of the algorithms are much better than others in terms of that. So, you know, uh, the ones that retain the memory as it's going along, like the kernel ones and stuff are going to be a little more expensive. Uh, but I, I don't think there's a, a solid recommendation aside from just your regular MATLAB um, performance recommendations um, that will, uh, you know, be sort of a, a guideline. Um, also, I, I would say too, you can use MATLAB online and, um, you know, the resources are from AWS. Like you can also use whatever cloud mechanism you want and just run your MATLAB there. If you don't have the resources available, it's really very easy to set up. Um, and you can, again, use MATLAB online even without GPUs or parallelism, um, that machine might or would likely be uh, better than, uh, you know, something, I don't know, <laughs> like that. So a uh, lot of options for um, maintaining or uh, working around, I guess, uh, some of the limitations that you might have with your machine. Yeah, you see, 
mentioned um, uh, managing uh, uh, costs. Can you can you give us a, a, a little demonstration about adjusting costs? Sure. So it's still running, so it might not let me save it. But uh, I just did this little button here for misclassification costs, and you notice it's kind of the opposite of the identity matrix, where you know it's just kind of penalizing everyone the same, right? So if we really wanted to tell the difference between sitting and standing, just crank that up right there. And then we can also crank it up the other way. You know, just kind of, I mean, again, there are many reasons why you might want to do it the other way, but you know, that that would penalize those ones more. Um, and you can always, it makes it kind of easy to experiment with it. Uh, the functional versions of calling these also have options to uh, just pass in a matrix of the costs. Uh, so that's one easy way to tweak, and then um, it will just apply that in the algorithm. To notice another one will come up. Yeah. Cool. Good question. And I'll also we just quickly mention too about there's optimiz optim optimizable uh, models here where those are going to like tune the parameters as you go. So uh, that's another good way to kind of, um, you know, if you're not super happy with the spread or you're kind of worried about that output in the confusion matrix, you could always try optimizing. Um, and then it goes through and does a lot uh, more to the uh, to determine the right parameters, basically. So it's speaking about uh, uh, choosing it as you go along. Um, is there a way to check the impact from each predictor? Um, I think it'd be helpful in, in selecting which predictor will be useful and train faster in the future. Yeah, definitely. So um, we're kind of focused on one visualization here, but there are a lot of different ways to kind of visualize that. And uh, you know, I'm doing a lot right now, I'm really testing it. Um, some of these plots could be really helpful for you know which ones uh, might be useful, which ones are really you know separating out the classes. And then um, a lot of the uh, models, well, at least the like say classification trees have a predictor importance um, method along with it, where it'll give you a calculation of how important each one is. But if you look into the, if you look at the doc, um, you can actually find a bunch of stuff. Oh, jeez. <laughs> let's make sure. Um, let's see, feature collection. All right, that could work. Um, but some of these uh, give you a lot of different ways to uh, go about doing that. So. Uh, there's also a doc page um, somewhere that shows. Uh, here we go. Oh, oops, <laughs> that's file exchange, but also a, a good thing to look at. Um, but anyways, there's a lot of different ways to uh, calculate this. Um, you know, some of them are more statistical uh, speaking. Other ones do like a neighborhood component analysis. Um, you know, things like that to try to figure out which um, predictors are more important. That also sort of leads into, um, I mentioned the FitC auto uh, function, or um, yeah, I mentioned the function at least in uh, the doc page example. Um, but this is basically doing the same thing as the app does. So it's just fit classification automatically, you just kind of fit all of them and see what's happening. Um, so that's also something that you could do where you, uh, autom you know, automate the selection process, it gives you back the best one. And then you can also automate the feature selection process. So that can be really helpful too. Good one. All right. Let's uh, move on to our last model. I think the one that was left in the dust. <laughs> and then you also just did neural network versus neural network. Um, oh, this is the last calls one. coming from inside the house. Yes, <laughs> it is. It is. Um, but it also gave an opportunity to talk about all the different kinds of options. You know, even within just that model, um, there are so many different options. The documentation, you know, the actual function has, you know, every single thing possible listed. The app does the most common ones, so you can always adjust. But you know, I definitely recommend looking at the dog. Neural network, always a fan favorite. Always a fan favorite. <laughs> so we'll, we'll talk about this one almost exclusively next time. Um, but just to get an idea, you know, what it basically um, 
takes a number of neurons, a number of nodes, basically it's sort of the circles here, um, and then uh, sort of optimizes weights and biases uh, based on some um, mathematical equation, right? So it's it really, really depends on, uh, at least at this point, it's, it's weighted sums in just sort of the basic or the, um, you know, sort of old school neural network where we're not talking about deep learning with many, many layers, you know, we're just talking about kind of the um, standard optimization of the weights and biases. Uh, you can change the transfer function. You have a lot of options for that. Um, but basically the difference in these uh, classifiers that you see on the screen are or in the app are, um, you know, narrow to wide. That's how many neurons there are. So just like the tree is sort of like how many nodes or how many, you know, uh, how much noise and how much data you're going to capture. And then your uh, layers is just you know, how many layers and we'll talk about next time um you know many many layers hundreds thousands so just you know two or three here not too bad to understand all right so um in this case the uh, i always just kind of look at the well the wide neural network did the best let's go back and make sure that's true uh yeah so but that is also the one that has the most nodes so kind of like the tree you know i always um you know it's the like fine tree and like the wide neural network, the ones with the most, you know, things to fit that, that those ones are always pretty sus. And then, you know, you want to um, just make sure you're kind of uh, thinking about all of those different options or just remembering if your data is very noisy, you want to kind of avoid that and go with something more medium or narrow. So, in at least our classification, which our next part is going to be super quick, but um, our SVM was the best one for Canon still training that one part. Um, but the uh, classification learner will usually will highlight it. I just can't find it because mouse is going too fast. There it is. Um, you know, it'll give you the uh, best uh, in terms of accuracy. But again, you want to check out the different plots and like make sure. Um, you're taking into account the things that are important to you. Do you have any insight as to why SVM uh, performed the best of our, our competitors? That's a good question. Yeah, I was kind of, so in, whenever we first started out, I was expecting the SVM or uh, ensembles to do the best just because of that um, sort of signal kind of noisy uh, stuff that I was talking about before, where it doesn't make those assumptions or apply much, you know, mathematical insight. Um, so it is a little interesting. I would uh, want to poke into the data more of, you know, if the, uh, you know, it's quadratic versus cubic versus linear, you know, that that might make a difference. Um, here, they're all about the same, but, uh, you know, some of those might be kind of unexpected where it's like, oh, I didn't think about, you know, a cubic relationship, you know, between the um, boundaries. So it's, it's, it's great, I think, also very common um, for that reason. Uh, but like I said, you know, before with uh, different calculations, you know, once you get into kernels and things like that, it could take a while to train. So it's just something to keep an eye out for. All right, that's the one. It got a gold star. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but special mention, because we did talk a little bit about neural networks. Uh, the first one, at least in a toolbox, was back way, way back in 1992. So these are some nostalgic screenshots for people, um, maybe. <laughs> but it's interesting because, you know, these are, although you know many of us are learning about them or studying them um, you know, for the first time, you know, these are sort of old calculations that are uh, recently been very enabled by, you know, GPUs and hardware and things like that. So it's I think it's it's great stuff to talk about. Also, naive bees, I think, was like back way back in the 90s, too. So all kinds of good stuff. There is a um, documentation link uh, that we'll share here that has kind of a breakdown of this. Uh, again, kind of um, gives a little bit of an indication to interpretations and how fast uh, things might be. We didn't get into that too much. We just kind of hinted at it. But, you know, again, it's uh, dependent on your machine. So. Uh, mine managed to survive the storm so far, so we won't push it any further. Um, but just a couple of notes, you know, a lot of these are better for kind of that data assumption. So if you know your data really well, you can kind of, you know, disqualify some uh, from the very beginning. Uh, so that was why I was kind of leaning toward these ones, because this is, you know, 
nonlinear kind of signal data, uh, which you know tend to be good for those. All right, so I'm just gonna uh, go through the slides. I want to make sure we have time for questions. Um, but you know, uh, the reason we I'm gonna fly through regression is because most of the models are super similar. So we have SVMs, trees, you know, all of those are listed. So we just wanted to kind of point out the ones that are not listed. Yeah, and before uh, you get started on uh, the regression one, we have a, a question from the audience about what's the difference between logistic regression and classification? Ooh, good question. So actually, yeah, I meant to mention that when it was here. So you notice logistic regression is grayed out here. Um, so it's expecting a binary decision, just two classes, right? So it does a lot of um, some, you know, it does the probabilistic, um, you know, uh, assumptions. So, uh, it, but it tends to be more used for classification because it can um, basically have a one or zero or, you know, those two binary ones. That's why it was grayed out here because it doesn't work. Um, but it uses sort of the same concepts as regression as it's doing the calculation. Um, but again, it's sort of limited when it comes to classification by the binary aspect. Good question. Uh, there's a lot more. I mean, I could <laughs> I keep an eye on the time, but you know, I could go into a lot of the calculations, but the um, you know, equations, everything's listed in the doc. So you can find out a lot there. Uh, and also the machine learning on ramp, I believe, has a good bit of background for some of these to get you uh, started. All right, let's dive in. Awesome. All right, so uh, let me see if it's gonna work. Wow. Oh. All right. I'm just uh, loading up. This is the Fit R auto example, so it's using um, automotive data for uh, predicting the miles per gallon. So since I had already uh, cheated and had this going earlier, I'm just kind of showing this is how you uh, go through and choose your data. Um, we're predicting miles per gallon uh, based on this stuff, some of them categorical. So that's good uh, just in case. And then uh, here I just select all models, use parallel, go to town. So while that's happening, I'll talk about the ones that are not uh, the ones that we've already talked about. So linear is always a good place to start. Um, had we started with regression, that's definitely where it was started because it's basically y equals mx plus b, but it's a bunch of variables. And the you know straightness of the line can be different. And the GPR kind of has like, uh, you know, like I was talking about with the kernels, it sort of does a smoothing kind of calculation where it starts to understand a pattern. So that's going to be really good. Like I use that for um, predicting, well, COVID cases. Um, so, you know, those kinds of things where it, like, you know, the sequence depends on the prediction. Those are really good for that. But they also take longer for that reason. Uh, <clears throat> I should have been using this <laughs> to describe that, um, but like kind of gives you a sense of what's going on. And then again, with linear, you know, you we think of it as a straight line, but it also includes quadratic, cubic, you know, those kinds of relationships. Um, let's go back to our app. Again, really testing the limits. A um, couple of things here, since we're predicting a number, we don't have that you know percentage or how many are right or wrong. That's uh, a little uh, grayer area, but you have the root mean squared error. So that's our MSE. So that's basically just you know uh, taking the difference between the points and then um, you know accounting for noise. So we want the lowest, so zero is ideal. Um, so if we look at linear, like we got 3.25, and fortunately this was a pretty small data set, so it didn't take all day. Um, but actually the GPR was uh, the best. Not by too much, but you know, uh, 2.5 uh, versus three. So again, here is where I would, you know, there are a lot of options, kind of why I put them all in the slide, where it's like, do you know what a return five halves GPR is. If not, and if you don't want to research it, maybe you don't want to use that one if it's pretty similar to something else, or you want to do your homework before you know passing it on to the next phase, uh, just you know if you're not familiar. So again, kind of hinting at that interpretability or explainability, even if it's the best model and it does the best, it may not be the best for understanding why. Um, and then 
we're just looking at the plot here with, you know, the sort of right and wrong predictions. But there are a couple other things you could do. You could kind of look at uh, the residuals or the spacing between how far off they were. And then um, this sort of predicted versus actual, you kind of want like a straight line ideally. So that'll really help you compare. And then R squared is a little bit more straightforward of a calculation people are pretty familiar with. You want a one uh, for that one. It's kind of, you know, the uh, fitting the line kind of action. All right, crash course, there you go. <laughs> so um, here, yeah, the, of course the GPR, um, you know, is gonna capture more stuff. Uh, but again, it takes a long time. Uh, usually those are the ones that are kind of hanging around because they're trying to understand the data. Um, so also I love to fit a linear model either way because you can always get a good, you know, kind of that question about the variables. You can get stuff about, um, you know, ANOVA. You can get more information about the predictors and how it's uh, working out. Whew. Wow, that was a lot. So uh, just a couple of things before we uh, take the uh, final questions, just stuff we kind of mentioned, we have functions that deal kind of the things that were in the app. Um, we talked a little bit about the hyperparameter tuning, but definitely, you know, if we wanted to get the best model, if we were really in like a, you know, hackathon or something, you know, oftentimes you're uh, tuning the parameters and you're fine tuning, you know, some um, model already. So definitely check that out. Uh, also, there are models that, you know, aren't necessarily in the app. We use the most popular ones. So, you know, it's good to poke around if you're not sure. Um, and then <clears throat> since we're talking about explainability and interpretability, there's actually a whole page on that because it's so important for a lot of our uh, MATLAB users, you know, building things for cars and planes and things like that. So, you know, kind of gives a breakdown of like which models are easier to understand and document and then different techniques on like, um, you know, models that will actually help you understand that stuff. So yeah, we won't spend time on that. We'll just kind of pause here for uh, some questions and wrap it up. It seems that we've uh, outlasted the storm so far. So far, so good. All right, any questions so far or any that we didn't address yet? No? Oh. We do have a, a question about the, the Quantizer app, although uh, uh, David is a little bit like, if it's off topic, don't worry about it. Um, is there any chance you could you could demo network quantization or is this a, a, a deep learning topic that we shouldn't get into now? Yeah, we probably should wait for next week. I definitely think it'll take longer than the 10 minutes we have allocated. Um, we will talk a little bit about some of the apps that will help for that, but you you have some um, ability via apps to adjust some, and then there are some uh, functionality uh, to help with that too. So yeah, we'll we'll save that for the next time I think. But um, oh, yeah, <laughs> getting lots of signs that we should, and I don't know if you heard the, all the sirens. Um, but yeah, we'll we'll definitely talk about that. I'll make a note to talk about that for sure, and the next one. Uh, yeah, good stuff. And also, yeah, if you, if you can't find it in the doc, I would reach out. I have the, although it looks weird right now, um, like our social media information, obviously the MATLAB channels too. You can just, you know, ask questions, tech support. Don't forget about that. Um, MATLAB answers, you know, so you can find a lot more uh, in the community at large. And we'll talk more about this next week, but, or two weeks from now, uh, but a lot of models, you know, on Onyx or other, you know, GitHub or other things like that, that you can just, you know, get right away. It's not, you're not kind of limited to whatever is in the app. Um, so, you know, a lot of different options for that stuff. All right. I guess if we don't have any other questions or comments, um, we can kind of wrap up our big competition, um, our first competition, our modeling for machine learning. Um, Thank you so much for all of your attention and questions. This is great. And we'll definitely be back for uh, more talking about uh, you know, how some of these models stack up against uh, different data sets. Thanks, everyone. Bye.